Hi, I'm Beckme Berserker and welcome back to my channel, and to yet another exploration of a classic Beckme adventure module. This time we're diving into the second box set in the Beckme series, The Expert Rules, to explore an adventure module that was included with it. It is, of course, X1, The Isle of Dread. X1, The Isle of Dread was written by David Cook and Tom Moldvay for play with characters of levels 3 to 7, and first published in 1981 initially included in the edition of Dungeons & Dragons just before Beckme, commonly referred to as BX. The artwork and branding got a bit of an overhaul when the module was republished in 1983 to be included in Frank Mensa's Expert Rules. It's this edition I have a hard copy of, which I'll use to carry out this deep dive. The first thing we need to consider before carrying out our exploration of X1 is why it was included in the Expert Rules. Well, the main reason was to support the new wilderness rules included in that set. X1, The Isle of Dread, was the first published adventure module to focus on the exploration of the wilderness, and it did this by grabbing the tools provided to us in the expert set with both hands. I'll demonstrate what these tools were as we move through the video. Just to say, I will be referring to the expert rules rather than the amalgamated rules cyclopedia when exploring this module, due to their close relationship. As for the theme of this module, the Isle of Dread was set in a tropical archipelago and shrouded in mysteries about savage natives, long lost treasures and fallen civilizations. So it really played into the tropes of classic literature, such as Treasure Island, Robinson Crusoe and the Alan Quatermain series, whilst also leaning into the movie genre, especially King Kong, which although had been released in 1933, incredibly that's almost 100 years ago now, still had a huge impact on the entertainment culture of the early 80s. You know what, it's just occurred to me that in 1983, King Kong was 50 years old, the same age Star Wars will be very soon. Wow, what a depressing thought. Anyway, back to the video. X1 The Isle of Dread gave players of Dungeons & Dragons the opportunity to be adventurous explorers, or shipwreck survivors. It evoked images of a lost world wilderness and frightening cannibals, who'd sooner eat you than look at you. It gave the players somewhere exciting to head, after the stuffy, claustrophobic environment of the dungeon, and to go there by sail was something else entirely. You really need to sit back and get a sense of the time when this module was published. Newer players will be lucky enough to have benefited from the evolution of Dungeons & Dragons over the years, meaning they will have access to so many options right out of the gate. For those of us who grew up whilst Dungeons & Dragons was maturing, this was incredibly new, it was like, what? You mean we can go outside now? And I can have a ship? Cool. Players who arrived at the hobby later may wonder whatever stopped us from doing this stuff before, and I guess the answer is nothing. But it was Dungeons and Dragons, so leaving the dungeon didn't necessarily occur to many of us as part of the game. We would set off from the town and arrive at the dungeon. All that other stuff didn't matter, until now. So that's the premise. Let's have a look at the presentation of the module. X1 The Isle of Dread consisted of 32 pages, which if you didn't know is pretty much the average size for a Beckme adventure module. It consisted of the usual removable cover that doubled as a DM screen. This one consisting of three panels detailing maps of some intriguing locations. Interestingly, the content of the module includes a centerfold map of the known world, in relation to the Thanagioth archipelago, as the islands of the far south of the mainland were known. This map expanded on that of the mainland included in the expert rulebook, but what that rulebook didn't include was any background information on the nations illustrated. That was included in the Isle of Dread module. Confused? Well, maybe you have a right to be. Before we even get into the adventure proper, we are informed about the nations and makeup of the known world, specifically those nations on the mainland. In my opinion, the placement of this information is wrong, and should have somehow been included in the main content of the expert rules, as it has little to do with the actual adventure. There's even a pronunciation guide on the final page of the Isle of Dread module that just feels like a bit of throwaway content, but which is actually extremely important to campaigning in the known world. With both the basic and expert box sets being released in the same year, 1983, it seems there wasn't any time to address these issues for the latest edition of the game, so they remained inside the 1983 release of the Isle of Dread module. To be honest, it's not really that big of a deal, but it does mean that, apart from the Gazetteer series which began in 1987, 
The place to find information on the known world was in an adventure module and not one of the rule books, which seems a little bit off to me, but let me know what you think in the comments. Apart from that centerfold map of the known world, the module contains numerous others that detail specific locations on the island, and of course this lovely map of the island itself. Eight pages in total were taken up with these maps, and together with that page given to describing the known world, we are left with 23 pages of text for the adventure proper. Turning back to the cover for a moment, two of the three inside panels have been given over to an intriguing location called Taboo Island, whilst the third depicts an extract from a ship's log. The reverse of this panel is of most interest to the players though, depicting what looks like, at first glance, an unfinished map of the Isle of Dread. What does this mean? Well, for that we'll need to dive into what the Isle of Dread was all about, and what exactly was the hook. The truth is, the Isle of Dread is an incredibly simple adventure module. The party, who are assumed to be in Specularum in the Grand Duchy of Karamekos, are involved of a cache of scrolls found by an adventuring party. The text does not make it clear whether this is an NPC party or your own, so you could make this fit any way you want. The critical bit of information is that some of these scrolls contained the pages of a ship's log, which included the extract on the panel I spoke about earlier, as well as an unfinished map. Reading the log, written by a long-dead pirate called Rory Barbarossa, it speaks of a land in the Thanagioth archipelago that the natives called the Isle of Dread, a wild land that exists behind a great wall built by the gods, where there is rumoured to be an inland city filled with treasure, including a huge black pearl of the gods. The log goes on to say that the coast of the island was mapped by sailing around it, but that they will return with a new crew to venture inland and make claim to its riches. It becomes apparent after asking the locals in Specularum that Rory died a horrible death 30 years ago during an argument with a wizard, and never returned south. Could the treasure written about still be there? Simple and effective. There be treasure and mysterious things, go take a look. It's the getting there that becomes quite interesting. The party will need to secure a ship, and numerous ways of acquiring one are detailed if the party do not have the finances and a busy DM could give their players some fun in trying to obtain this ship and finance its crew. This is where the new expert rules come into play, as it contains information on how much it costs to hire different types of crew members or even mercenaries that may act as armed mariners in case of an unwanted attention on the long journey. Some devious dungeon masters might even want to begin the adventure here, as other unscrupulous sorts hear about the venture and, possibly, have got wind of the wild rumour of Barbarossa's missing fortune. Perhaps they try to mug the party on land for the map, or maybe they set sail to ambush the party in open sea. Who knows, but the opportunity to be creative is there for the taking, and there's no better incentive for characters to get a move on than when thinking someone else might want to get to the treasure first. Instilling paranoia in the players is, in my opinion, the greatest motivator in any role-playing game. So before I go too far, let's have a quick look at how this adventure module is actually set up. There are six specific chapters, and the first is called Preparing for the Adventure, which simply details what this adventure module is about and how to use it. Beginning the adventure gives details about the known world, which I've already mentioned, and sets out information on finding Rory's ship's log and possible next steps in getting the characters to the island. This is where we are now. The next chapter is General Island Adventures, which outlines the bulk of island exploration. You may wonder how an entire island of adventure can be contained in such a small number of pages, but I'll give you my thoughts on that soon. After this, there is the Central Plateau Adventures chapter, playing on imagery from The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and is an obvious siren for the characters to notice as they travel the island, as the plateau is 3,000 feet high and approximately 25 miles wide. Could this be where the lost inland city is? Reaching the plateau and dealing with its inhabitants leads on to the Taboo Island Adventures chapter, where the party may win the treasure hinted at by Barbarossa's notes, but may also encounter the gods. The final chapter is the appendix, detailing further adventures on the Isle of Dread, some of the inhabitants of the native people, and of course, details of new monsters. So let's return to beginning the adventure and see how the expert rules lent itself to this chapter. The journey from Specularum to the landing point on the Isle of Dread is approximately 1,000 miles, so that's about the distance between New York City and Miami as the crow flies, a significant distance in a sailing ship. 
As there are no actual fixed encounters for this journey, the text in X1 informs the DM to roll 1d6 for an encounter at least once per day, with a 6 meaning they have encountered something. They are then directed to refer to the ocean list on the Wilderness Encounters table in the Expert Rules to determine what encounter has occurred. I've put this on the screen for you to look at. As you can see, there are only four categories of encounter here, which might seem pretty meaningless on their own. Specifically, men, flyer, swimmer, and dragon. After rolling 1d8 and consulting this table, we would then have to refer to these encounter tables to roll 1d12 to determine the type of men, flyers, or swimmers encountered, or 1d10 for the type of dragon encountered, due to being at sea. In my opinion, some common sense is required here, so if you happen to roll for Sturges or Sprites, but find your party are nowhere near one of the few islands that might be passed, then it probably doesn't make much sense, so you could roll again. Or you could perhaps engage that devious DM brain of yours and turn the creature rolled into a sea version. Blood-sucking sea Sturges that fling themselves across the bow of a ship, just like flying fish, seem particularly gruesome, especially when flapping web-like wings in ungainly flight. Giving the party the opportunity to stomp on intercepted creatures falling to the deck conjures up all kinds of hysterical images, but I digress. However the encounters go on the journey to the Isle, some common sense is required in terms of wearing your party out before the game has even started. Underlying the number of random encounters that might be had at this stage is the time the journey might take, and this is, of course, dependent on the type of transport used. Once again, we may refer to the expert rules which lists numerous types of waterborne transport and their average movement rates, which I've highlighted. The dual entries refer to the movement rates for both rowing and sailing, if your vessel is capable of both. Looking to the right of these numbers, we get an indication of crew numbers required to man the vessel of choice. This can have a direct impact on the crew costs I mentioned earlier, or you can hand wave it, depending on the amount of bookkeeping you want in your game. Me, I think managing resources is a major part of old school gaming that has been brushed over in recent years, so I heartily recommend you get your players thinking about these logistics, because once you're into ship and crew costs, and how long the journey will take, you're also into the realms of food and water, and when the players realise the importance you place on this, they can, in my opinion, surprise themselves in how interesting they find the whole endeavour. Of course, the greatest impact on ship's movement is the weather and the expert rules delivers once again, as shown here. X1 states that we should check the weather once per day, showing that a roll of 2d6 will determine the conditions. As we can see here, a roll of 2 could have a ship that is incapable of rowing stuck in a becalmed region, whilst high winds can have you off to the races. A gale can have you just running before it in any direction. Just pray that land isn't in the way. There is also the potential to get lost, although I'll cover that in more detail when we make landfall. So overall, a party might risk travelling in a vulnerable sailboat, averaging 72 miles a day, taking 14 days to reach their destination. That's 14 each of weather and wilderness checks, with no extra crew for help in times of peril. If I was doing it, I'd choose a longship. It travels faster, has a rowing speed, and a large enough crew that doubles as marines. I mean, come on, this is screaming Vikings. So what's not to love about this choice? So just to reiterate, the expert rules was the support mechanism for running the Isle of Dread. The wilderness encounter generator presented us with the potential for things to happen over the 1000 mile journey. Ship descriptions enabled us to work out a time frame for the journey, as well as give us information about how strong the vessel might be. And we got a weather generator and information about what happens in certain conditions. And we even had rules for getting lost, which I will soon cover. So assuming the party has reached the coast of the Isle of Dread unscathed, or at the very least on the right side of dead, then X1 strongly directs the DM to have them make landfall at the neck of a peninsula in the southeast of the island, where there sits the small village of Tanaroa. We're going to have to get the map of the Isle of Dread on the screen for this. For information, each of these hexes is at a scale of 6 miles. Tanaroa is here, bizarrely the only village not labelled in the region. The influence on the players choosing this particular location to land also comes from the text in Rory Barbarossa's log, and this player's map showing a number of villages, but only one next to a great wall. It's this location that appears to be what Barbarossa called Tanaroa. I think it's worth just covering off here the potential for some DMs to have to deal with players wanting to go off-piste, 
and land at the location of their choosing anywhere on the island's coastline. In all honesty, there's not much in the text of X1 to specifically state that the players can't do this, and I suppose that's right. The players, after all, can do what they like. However, there are a few things to consider that those without maritime experience might not be aware of. First, this map of Barbarossa's shows mountains on most of the coastline. I would translate this as most of the coast of the island being a great mesa, or elevation, meaning sailors would be greeted with foreboding cliffs, and any place that might be landed would only mean an incredibly challenging climb to the top. Should players still be tempted to land at such a location or uninhabited jungle or swamp, they will be leaving their ship vulnerable to other travellers on the open seas. We already know from Barbarossa's previous journey that the area attracts opportunists, and besides, a lack of natural harbours would render a vessel extremely exposed to adverse weather conditions. All in all, landing anywhere apart from a friendly village sitting at sea level is a bad idea, so reminding the players of this fact can be helpful. And so, as the party makes landfall, we enter the General Island Adventures chapter. General is about right for the name of this chapter. Actually consisting of only seven pages of adventure text, what might be the bulk of the adventure, due to its exploratory nature, is actually quite lean in terms of depth and intrigue. I'll cover this in four sections, the first being a brief dive into Tanaroa and Peninsula village culture, and a look at that wall that crosses the neck of the peninsula, as well as my thoughts on running this bit. We'll then explore the mechanism for how to track the party's travel across the island, commonly referred to today as the Hex Crawl. Building on this, we'll examine the detailed encounters in this relatively short chapter, and then I'll give my own thoughts on how I think this part of the module can be strengthened, given the party will be spending so much time in it. So let's kick off with a look at Tanaroa and the other villages on the peninsula. Tanaroa is actually one of seven villages, these being Tanaroa, Kirikura, Dawa, Mora, Panatubi, Burawao, and Usi. What's quite obvious is the attempt to convey a South Pacific feel with these names, and I would take that as my cue as to how the cultures of these villages appear and behave. Each of these villages is a matriarchy, meaning their chiefs are female. Each village is made up of peoples from four clans. These are the Hawk, Tiger, Sea Turtle and Elk clans. I have to say I find the placement of an Elk clan in a tropical location a little strange, so I would change this to a creature more conducive to the environment, even if we do find the giant Elk as a new monster in this module. We are told that each clan leader is male, so that's four male clan leaders led by a female chief. In addition, we are informed of a shamanistic role named Zombie Master or Mistress, who leads a curious cult of the walking dead. We don't really get much more information than this, except that the cult is secretive and they create zombies and such for extra labouring work as needed, but which the locals are frightened of. I can understand the culture of using a zombie workforce, but why all the secrecy? This isn't explained, so I think it's a shame that this particular role wasn't fleshed out a bit more, and it would be something I would definitely go into myself when running the module. We are told that the setup for each village is basically the same, and we're directed to use this map of Tanaroa if any of the other six villages are visited. Obviously, you have to ignore the great big wall at the top of the map. I have a few thoughts about this setup and the whole clan thing. First, it's incredibly repetitive. So much so that having multiple villages really serves no purpose, except to serve the potential for trade. It's incredibly reminiscent of a computer game, where you leave a generic village and arrive at an identical village with a different name. Second, why do we have all the same clans in each village? Wouldn't it be better to have each clan have their own village? This would be a required change for me, and could lead to inter-clan conflict, which the party can get mixed up in. Crucially, we have this map which we're told is to be used for each village, and there is a small pyramid in the centre, from which we're told business is conducted. What business? What's it for? Coming back to Tanaroa for a moment, we're told that the villages themselves refer to the land beyond the wall as the Isle of Dread, and rarely go there, except to obtain tar for house and boat repairs. The wall is said to have been built by what the Tanaroans call the gods, and stands 50 feet high for a length of two miles across the peninsula's neck interspersed by a total of 28 70-foot tall towers. Tanaroa sits by the gate of this wall, consisting of two 5-foot thick wooden doors measuring a full 80 feet across and 40 feet tall. It's quite apparent the locals could not have built such an edifice, 
and any questioning of them about what is beyond gives no information about any lost city, or indeed the gods. Truly, this is an epic location, but I think the tameness of the introduction of the Tanaroans and the compromising nature of each clan living happily together just takes away the menace of the place. When I run the Isle of Dread, I really lean into the whole King Kong thing. That pyramid in the village's center becomes a sacrificial mound, and through that the zombie master gains a regular flow of new recruits. The victims of sacrifice are stolen from the other three clans, generating conflict between them. And the purpose of this sacrifice? To satisfy the gods beyond the wall, so that they may never have to come through it, and obtain their own victims whilst laying waste to everything. So, no giant gorilla, but plenty of opportunity to dupe the party into thinking they're safe, whilst then attempting to kidnap one of them as a sacrificial victim. X1 suggests that going through the gate and beyond the wall is relatively easy, and that you can even hire a guide and henchman from amongst the Tanaroans. But again, this is all a bit fluffy for me, and lacks the dread that the title of this module should be inducing. Therefore, I'm much more inclined to begin a running battle after it becomes apparent the party are to become the latest sacrificial victims. With their only route of escape being through the gates, a chase through the village and a series of combats with tattooed natives and zombie masters can make this achievable, with the villagers not desperate enough to give chase beyond the wall. Just to be clear, this is how I run it. The module as written makes getting through the wall so much easier, and if I'm honest, it's a bit touristy. The party can just turn up and be let through, so that the main event can happen. But what are your thoughts? How have you run this part of the adventure, and what did you think? It would be really interesting to read your comments. Okay, so however the characters get beyond the wall, we are into the bulk of the adventure, the exploration of the Isle of Dread, which for all intents and purposes is a hex crawl, but as far as I'm aware this term was not used back in the early 80s. That said, it's clearly a nod towards the term dungeon crawl, that has also arisen in recent years. So how was exploration to be conducted? To put it another way, how does one carry out a hex crawl? Well, to explain that, we need to return to the player's map of the Isle, the one that was included in Rory Barbarossa's ship's log. As you can see, there are lots of blank hexes on this map. We're told that each hex represents six miles, mirroring the DM's map from earlier. Okay, so all well and good, but what do I do with this? To answer that, we must once again refer back to the expert rules on adventuring in the wilderness. But essentially, the characters must state what direction they're heading in, that is, what hex they're entering, and the dungeon master lets them know what the terrain in that hex is. The expert rules state that normally, only the hex being entered can be mapped, but the Isle of Dread text is far more forgiving, and allows for the mapping of seven hexes for every move, that being the hex entered and the six surrounding hexes, kind of like what we would today refer to as a fog of war. This is not a given, and the final word is the DMs. If they believe the party's vision would not have extended into certain hexes, based on the terrain, then those will be unknown until entered. So in practice, once the party reach the area beyond the gate that is unmapped, the hex crawl would begin, with the DM telling the players to fill in the hexes with the standard terrain symbols, as shown on the DM's map. In terms of rate of movement, the expert rules informs us to divide the normal movement rate per turn of the slowest party member by 5, to obtain the miles travelled per day in clear terrain. Remember, that's normal movement, not encounter movement. So a party whose slowest member has a normal movement rate of 60 feet would travel 12 miles per day, or 2 hexes. However, this can be affected by more hardier environments, so travel through mountains or jungle would reduce the example I've given down to one hex per day. Of course, travelling through unknown territory is never easy, and to account for this, there is always the possibility that a party will get lost. The chance of this is dependent on the terrain being travelled through, and we can see this here in this text from the expert rules. So for each day of travel, the DM would roll 1d6, and these results would mean the party becoming lost. So what does that mean in practice? Well, the DM obviously keeps that information to themselves, and randomly determines the actual direction of travel, as shown in this illustration, communicating the terrain for the actual hex entered, rather than the desired one. This can have amusing consequences as the party begin to map incorrectly, potentially stumbling into areas they didn't want to go. However, this is where the 1 plus 1 hex fog of war can actually be of help to the players. Because of this, they should quickly become aware of discrepancies on their map, 
and be able to walk themselves back to where things went awry. So X1's approach to mapping hexes is much kinder to the potential for getting lost than the core expert rules. And I think this is a good thing. I think getting lost is something that should be a risk in traveling through the wilderness, but no one is going to have a good time if, due to just being able to map one hex at a time, no one is able to work out where the party actually got lost, whether they are still actually lost, or where to go back to. It'd be great to know your experiences of the lost mechanic if you have any. Of course the game would become quite bland if it just got bogged down into hex crawl drudgery, so X1 directs the DM to check for wandering monsters once during the day and again at night. Specially developed wandering monster tables have been made available for this, and it is quite clear from these that the Isle of Dread is a dangerous paradise, filled with the kinds of fantasy monsters you might expect, but also an extensive array of dinosaurs from Earth's prehistory. Each table relates to a geographical region of the island, meaning that you are more likely to meet dinosaurs in one area than another, which is sensible. Although I do note the giant elk entry here as well, which I still find odd in a tropical wilderness. Is it just me? I'd change that to a giant antelope or something. Underpinning all this exploration activity is what's called the Order of Events, found in the expert rules, to support wilderness travel. This is a great prompt to have parked to one side of your game, so that each step of exploration is accounted for. So all the way from the moment the party wake to the following morning, the DM can refer to this chart to ensure they have carried out the steps as appropriate. So that's how the islands can be explored using the expert rules, including how to determine wandering monsters. But what about fixed encounters? Well, in short, if the party stumble into a hex with a numbered location, they encounter it. The DM would have to determine the actual circumstances of the encounter, and we are only given brief text for each one, except for the information about Tanaroa and a few other settlements. In all, there are just 24 fixed encounters across the Isle of Dread, not including further exploration of the central plateau. I've listed them here for you. Most of these encounters have pretty brief descriptions made up of what the creature is and how they might behave, together with some specific details about the contents of their lair and the amount of treasure they have. Admittedly, these encounters do have the potential to be quite dry without any further work. However, you need to understand that there's only so much you can fit in a 32-page adventure module, so this is where the Dungeon Master needs to flex their imaginative muscle and describe how these encounters actually develop. The outcome of this, of course, is that people who play the Isle of Dread have very different experiences of each encounter. As you can see, I've separated the encounters into a variety of locations, with the mainland being the Isle of Dread and islets being the small isles surrounding it. Two of them are, in my opinion, uninspiring, given that they are called Random Encounter and just mean that any time spent within two hexes of the location means a certain encounter determined by the random tables I showed you earlier. For most of the mainland encounters that require a lair, we are referred to a couple of supporting maps. In fact, we're actually directed to these two maps six times, so clearly their use might be exhausted quite quickly. However, they are not sophisticated maps, and the implication here is that a DM should really come up with some kind of rough sketch loosely based on these for running the scenario. What's important is not the map, but how the scenario is run. So get that right, and the interior of a rough and ready lair doesn't really matter that much. There are several particular encounters here that deserve further examination, which are in fact settlements of varying sizes. These are a pirate lair, a Rakasta camp, a Phanaton settlement, and an Arania lair. Each of these is supported by a location-specific map to help flesh out the encounters a bit better. Let me just briefly focus on each of these. We're told the pirate lair is an outpost of another island, the choice of which is left to us. This map does a pretty decent job of letting us know where the 41 pirates living here spend their time, between the huts, towers and boats, amongst other places. What I really like about this map is that it isn't too sophisticated that anything in the description of the place is dependent upon it. What that means is that I can change things to suit my game, or even just use another map. We're told the pirates raid the coastal villages for slaves, so a party might want to stop that from happening, or they might want to engage in diplomacy to try to drive the slavers off without resorting to combat. It's really up for grabs, and I wouldn't necessarily have the pirates attack the party immediately on approach without some kind of interaction. Besides, the pirates might be used as a vehicle for information. Maybe one of them was a member of Barbarossa's crew back in the day. Turning to the Rakasta map, Rakastas are a new creature detailed in this module, described as nomadic feline humanoids, 
which in my opinion are quite reminiscent of modern tabaxi. No information is given in this encounter regarding whether Rakastas are immediately hostile to the characters, and there's no reason to think they would be. Therefore, I would have the party stumble upon this temporary map, as the Rakastas are resting during their nomadic travels. The Rakastas are described as proud and fierce, so there is that tribal warrior edge to them, but I think there is real scope here to develop links with a new race and develop it further. The next settlement encounter is the Phanaton Settlement, another new creature described in this module as a halfling-sized cross between a monkey and a raccoon, able to glide from tree to tree like a flying squirrel. What's interesting about the Phanaton Settlement is that it is 50 feet above ground in the trees and made up of tree huts and platforms, so it might not be immediately apparent to the party. Again, there is no information about how these creatures react to the characters, so once again a DM can make the encounter suit their campaign, but there is scope here to engage with them and learn more about the environment of the island and what dangers the party might be heading into. Finally, there is the Arania Lair. Arania are intelligent, spell-casting giant arachnids, who, like the Phanaton, live in the trees. Arania are definitely hostile, and see the party as a possible meal. They also have the ability to cast devious spells and poison them. Backed up by a small guard of bugbears, the Arania can be a difficult encounter in the hands of a devious DM. I'd play this carefully, probably with an edge of horror, as devious spiders attempt to pluck players off the ground. So that's the fixed encounters, which together with the possibility of numerous wandering encounters and getting lost, can take up a significant amount of time. I think there is the possibility that running this chapter could devolve into a bit of a grind, so it becomes incumbent on the DM to keep things interesting. So I thought I'd focus on a few things that I would do to strengthen this chapter and develop it further. As you run this game beyond the Great Wall of Tanaroa, there is a clear loss of that wall's meaning and the legend behind it. The encounters are pretty much nothing to do with any legends, and are just matter-of-fact occurrences. My advice is to steer this module back to what this place is supposed to be, an Isle of Dread. Therefore, it's important to both ramp up the menace of the place, whilst also dropping the odd reminder of a lost civilization that was once quite powerful. Admittedly, this can require quite a bit of extra work, given that for all the foreshadowing about gods beyond the wall, there is next to nothing about them in the module, something I will cover when we meet them later. So when an encounter is run, whether static or random, perhaps place it in an ancient overgrown settlement formed of unknown architecture. When the players ask questions, answer them evasively. For example, if a dwarf asks about the stonework, tell them they've not seen anything like it before, and that the architecture simultaneously follows a standard, whilst also defying physics in some ways. You could make this weirder by having any detect magic spells not find any, as the work is the result of some lost skill rather than sorcery. I think all of this can evoke some mystery that is otherwise lacking in the exploration phase of this module. Building on this is thinking about the geography of the isle a little more practically. One thing that jumps out at me about this map is its lack of rivers. There is the great one that goes through the middle of it, but this might imply to some that there are no others. An isle like this, with the climate it has, would be filled with rivers, rivulets and streams. This northeast peninsula screams out a descent in altitude as it moves from mountains to hills to jungle and swamp before eventually hitting the sea. This would be covered in watercourses and perhaps even a delta near the coast. So again, when an encounter is determined, perhaps think about its placement in the geography of the region. Perhaps the Tyrannosaurus you've encountered has you pressed against a river, clearly swarming in crocodiles. Or maybe the swamp in which you've encountered a black dragon has a stubborn mist that limits visibility. Get the players encountering Mother Nature as much as the monsters, and it should make for memorable moments. Finally, I think there was a missed opportunity in the original module to develop the volcanic regions on the map. There are two volcanoes in close proximity on the mainland, and a fixed encounter with rock baboons between them. Unfortunately, there is absolutely no reference to the volcanism of the region within that encounter, which is a shame. Beyond this though, we learn later in the module that the creatures referred to as the gods love hot environments, so there was an opportunity to place some evidence of their culture here. However, that opportunity was not taken, so I think it would be beneficial to place some of those abandoned settlements I mentioned earlier in these regions. Perhaps they are now the home of a red dragon, or even a tribe of fire giants. Or if you want to get really tropey with this, it could be the home of another savage tribe making sacrifices to the fire god, i.e. the volcano. Whatever way you want to run this chapter, I think my main piece of advice is to grab hold of it with both hands and make it your own. 
think creatively about what the intrepid explorers might come across and in what circumstances. I mean, I haven't even mentioned quicksand. Hmm, quicksand. I'd best get off this subject before my advice results in multiple TPKs. In short, this module is called the Isle of Dread, and it should feel like it. Right, so we're finally leaving the General Island Adventures chapter and heading into the Central Plateau Adventures chapter, which only takes up two pages of the entire module. As I alluded to earlier, the Central Plateau is 3,000 feet high and 25 miles wide, so it can be seen from a great distance and becomes an obvious place to head for, given Barbarossa's log. What's of particular interest is how the area is reached. The text states that this can be by rope bridge, flying or climbing. It's the rope bridge bit that I want to focus on. As you can see on this island map, this rope bridge spans a six mile hex. Well, this seems incredibly unrealistic and probably not the intention. The text for this location only states that there is a rope bridge and that it spans a great river. What's missing is the placement of this rope bridge and any accounting for its altitude. I mean, if the plateau is 3000 feet up, what's it attached to? This map suggests a mountain, but that feels a little off given the mountain would have to be quite close to the plateau, potentially blocking it from view. How I deal with this is to place a 3000 foot hoodoo about half a kilometre from the edge of the plateau, which has intriguing steps carved into its exterior that can be climbed all the way to the top, where the rope bridge can be reached. This can be explained away as a remnant of the original plateau and a route used by those on the plateau to explore the island if needed. It can also make for dangerous encounters with pesky Terranodons wanting an easy meal. Okay, so that's how I get the party onto the plateau. There are several encounters on the plateau, but the main event is within a dormant volcano that sits in the centre and dominates the area. As you can see on this map, the crater now contains a lake, and at the shore of this lake is the small village of Mantru. The bulk of this chapter is really centred on the interaction between the party and the villagers, with the latter trying to convince them to help deal with renegade tribesmen who have taken up residence at an ancient temple on an island at the centre of the lake, which they consider taboo to visit and therefore unable to do this themselves. The tribespeople are, therefore, not hostile to the party as they want something from them. What's clearly apparent though is that any reference to an inland city by Barbarossa in his ship's log has been grossly overstated. That said, there is clearly potential riches to be found in the temple, so the characters shouldn't be too disappointed. And that's it when it comes to this chapter. The villagers will supply the party with boats to reach the island and hope that is enough. Of course, the party may feel as though they are closing in on the lost treasure of the isle, especially that elusive black pearl mentioned in Barbarossa's log, so I don't think they will require that much convincing to make the trip. And so we're into the Taboo Island chapter, and almost at the end of the Isle of Dread module. Accessing Taboo Island is relatively easy once boats are acquired. Once tied off to the primitive quay, a few steps lead into a pillared room of ancient grandeur. That said, they are also greeted by primitive totems designed to scare off intruders, a clear indication of danger ahead. And danger there certainly is, as the renegade tribesmen spy for intruders from the other side of a rubble-strewn corridor, ready to alert the entire tribe located here in just this one area and we are told that the secret doors leading off this room have yet to be discovered. So this is kind of a last stand for these tribespeople, and if I'm honest, an average party will have quite a difficult time of it. Why? Well, because the group is quite large, so there are overwhelming odds, and it contains a few powerful individuals. The makeup of the tribe consists of 39 first level fighters, 3 third level fighters, 1 fifth level fighter, 1 seventh level fighter who is the chief, and one fifth level cleric who is the tribe's witch doctor. Some of these combatants are armed with poisonous weapons, so there is the potential to cause real harm to the characters. However, a clever party may be able to entice a large amount of the tribe to gather in one area before launching a fireball, which could take a great many out. I would have this happen a maximum of two times before the tribe learn not to group together, but by then it could be too late for them. Once the tribe is dispensed with, the rest of the temple is available for the party to explore. Of course, they must find the secret doors to go any further, but what DM isn't going to let that happen? And so we come to the infamous mapping error in this area, a wall seemingly blocking any access to area 35. This is easily rectified by pretending it's not there, but it was a nuisance when reading this decades ago, wondering if there was something you missed. Remember, there was no Reddit to ask. Room 37 is of particular interest, 
as it contains one of a few clues as to what the gods are, in containing some kind of altar for their worship, and a statuette of gold and coral depicting, and I'm quoting here, a strange amphibious humanoid that has a smooth head, large eyes, and a tentacled mouth. The torso is human-like and has two arms that end in webbed, clawed hands. From the waist down, the body divides into three long tentacles, each ending in fluke-like fins. Each fin is tipped in a single large claw. The description calls up images of Lovecraftian horror, and it's clear that whatever these creatures were, held great influence over the land sometime in the past. Indeed, some of that power still resides in this statue, with the potential for some disruption in the party. Level 2 of the temple is accessed through expiration, or the mixed luck of characters falling through weak floors and the like. As you can see, most of the level is flooded, which presents a number of pesky challenges, but probably the most significant encounter here is at location 39A, where the party can encounter the giant oyster that contains the Black Pearl, written off in Barbarossa's log. Valued at 3,000 gold pieces, it's a worthy find. There are some other notable places on this level, such as a horrible fire trap and a boiling U-bend that can't be much fun to be stuck in, but essentially this level leads to the final area of this adventure, level 3, the home of the gods. What's clear on arrival is that this area is just a single huge cavern of great size. The environment is incredibly perilous, with the description given as such. The floor of the cavern is a field of bubbling mud pots, small geysers, hot springs and mineral crusts. The colours are rich reds, browns and yellows, combined with blacks and greys. Terraces crusted with deposits from mineral springs extend from the sides of the cavern at several points. Stalactites hang from the ceiling, merging with stalagmites in several places to form pillars from the roof to the floor. The heat of the chamber prevents the use of infravision. Occasional flares of ruddy light, combined with great bursts of steam from the depths of some of the hot springs, briefly illuminate small points in the room. So clearly, there are many pitfalls the party must overcome just to navigate this area effectively. However, their most dangerous foes are what remain of the gods. I've mentioned them numerous times throughout this video, being first referred to in Barbarossa's log. So who or what are they? Well, the gods are an ancient race in decline called Kopru, an amphibious humanoid race, which is what was represented in the description of the statue I read out earlier. Being a heat-loving race, the Kopru have been limited in their expansion, having to remain in areas of high temperature. What makes the Kopru extremely dangerous is their strong charm ability, which can completely dominate their victims, enabling the Kopru to read their thoughts and also their memories. This domination is basically a carte blanche on control of the character, which has an unlimited range. A victim may get another save, but not for another month after falling to the charm in the first place. So no intelligence based save here then. And so we get a bit of insight into why this island on the central plateau is taboo, even if the current natives do not have any living memory of the reason. Once charmed, the Kopru can basically control an enslaved race. So staying off that taboo island and building walls to keep those dominated by the Kopru out starts to make more sense. There is no suggested limit on the number of people a Kopru can have charmed at any one time, so there is potential here for DMs to expand the campaign further and have the Kopru manipulate things as far away as on the mainland. It's all possible. Indeed, we are told in the text that should the entire party become enslaved, then the Kopru attempt to re-establish their kingdom. Has this happened to anyone running this? How far did things go? Or have you used the Kopru domination elsewhere in your campaign? In my opinion, it's got real potential for a campaign all on its own. If the Kopru are destroyed, then the characters have defeated the Isle of Dread, and there are plenty of spoils here and throughout the temple to compensate them. Indeed, the payday for completing all encounters on this island is quite respectable, so successful characters should climb at least a couple of levels. Before we wrap this up, and I give you my overall thoughts of this module, there is the final chapter to cover, and that is the appendix. This takes up the final five pages of the module, and consists of ideas for alternate scenarios for fleshing out the island, tools for creating human encounters, so this might be tribespeople of varying ranks or competing NPC parties. And finally, we have the new monsters section, giving us more delicious dinosaurs, information on the Arania, Racusta, and Phanatons, as well as some detail about the dreadful Kopru, which I have to say could have been fleshed out a bit more, but I guess that's what Dungeon Masters are for. So that's X1, the Isle of Dread. What are my thoughts? 
Well, as I mentioned earlier, this is a relatively simple module. If you ran it as written, you may find it become a little bland and repetitive as the party moves from hex to hex, defeating monsters and accumulating treasure. In my opinion, this module needs to be strengthened with a good bit of foreshadowing and Dungeon Master Guile to really evoke a tropical landscape that was once terrorized by a race that enslaved its people and probably abused them. And this for me exposes my strongest criticism of this module. I really would have liked that frightening aspect of the Kopru presented to the Dungeon Master a bit more obviously, and earlier. The power they wield could indeed be thought of as completely coercive, and their control of the local population would have been absolutely godlike to a primitive people. I mean, who can you trust in an environment like that? I think too much information is left to the Dungeon Master to realise for themselves, rather than made obvious, which means the true horror of Kopru domination can be overlooked. That is, the true dread that sits at the centre of the Isle may not be fully appreciated. That said, X1 The Isle of Dread can be a great adventure, and potentially a great campaign. It has mystery, danger and treasure. It has new races to discover, dinosaurs to hunt, and pirates to do what you want with. And underlying all that, it has the suggestion of a potential campaign to take over the mainland through Kopru controlled XPCs arriving in Specularum, splashing the cash, making friends and influencing people to come visit a wonderful plateau in the sun. What's not to love about that? And so I hope you have enjoyed my review or walkthrough of X1 The Isle of Dread. What's been your experience of it? How did you run the village of Tanaroa? Did any of them become dinosaur food? And did any of the party fall to the charm of the Kopru? It would be great to know. Otherwise, please give this video a like if you did indeed like it, and please hit the subscribe button if I've earned your future attention. If you'd like to thank me further, you can buy me a coffee, link on the screen or in the description. I'm Beckney Berserker, keep making your saving throws and I hope to see you back here soon.